Welcome back after a spring break. So it's been a while since we've been here, so um, it's probably going to take a few minutes for us to get back in sync with uh, Calc 2 things. We are in the supplement. Uh, we have spent a couple days in the supplement already, and um, the bulk of this we will finish, I hope, this week, with possibly a little bit of it uh, carrying over into next week. So we have the second order linear homogeneous differential equations. We've got the three basic cases. I think it'd probably be wise today to take a look at each of the three cases because you're probably remembering that there were three cases but not necessarily remembering what those three cases are at this very moment. So we'll take a review of each of the cases. Uh, one of the problems that I had some flawed information on that um, we were solving for, I think we solved for K1, and then we tried to solve for K2 with some other data, and K2 was eliminated because it had a coefficient of zero. Uh, I think I didn't actually find the problem, my source of the problem, but I think I've got a way to make that work out so we can go back and revisit that. Um, usually when we cover this information and we use... Um, this equation, which we had to use. We had to use that equation uh, in the third case where we had uh, complex roots to the, diff to the um, characteristic equation. So this was the third case. We had complex roots to the characteristic equation, and we put those complex roots up in the exponent position, and they had an I in them, so we had to simplify, and then one of the formulas we used was this one. Um, characteristic equation, let's make sure we, everything that gets mentioned today, we uh, adequately review what is that, where's that coming from. Characteristic, or as it's called in the little supplement, it's called an auxiliary equation. So if we have a um, an equation y double prime minus 4y prime, What's the characteristic equation that goes along with that? R squared minus 4R plus 11. Okay. R squared minus 4R plus 11. And that's where we're going to get our roots, right? So it's all based on the kind of roots that we get. Do we have two uh, complex roots? Then that we fall into case three. We'll do an example here in just a minute. Uh, if we have a double root, remember that, that was case two. We had a certain type of solution based on the solutions to the characteristic equation. And if we had two distinct real roots, we had another kind of equation. So we'll refresh those in a minute. But there's our characteristic equation. If the roots were complex, we had to use this thing right here to get it simplified. So we had this new function in terms of sines and cosines. I probably should not let that go without looking at this equation. Let's look at e to the i pi. That's three pretty strange numbers put together, all in the same equation. What do you think e to the i pi might be? Something really strange, right? E is strange. I is very strange. Pi is kind of strange. Let's see what that is. So according to this equation that we used the other day, e to the i theta would be cosine theta, so theta is pi, so it should be cosine pi. So everywhere there's a theta, we replace it with a pi. Got a pretty ugly mess there on the left side, but the right side is actually pretty easily simplifiable. 
What's the cosine of pi? Negative one. It's been spring break, right? I've been reading about that stuff and thinking about it over spring break a whole lot. I can tell that in your faces. And I times the sine of pi. Zero. So if that's zero, that's gone. So E is a pretty strange number. I is a strange number. Pi is a strange number. But when you combine them in this fashion, E to the I pi is negative one. That's kind of bizarre. Now, the equation that you sometimes see as a result of this, e to the i pi equals negative 1. Since e to the i pi is negative 1, you often see, not often, but I mean, it's, that's one of the more strange equations in all of mathematics because it's got some of the more important numbers that go all the way across all disciplines of mathematics. E, I, and pi. One is a pretty important number because that's how we progress through our number system. And zero. So there's a pretty unique equation which I failed to use the other day, but I happened to think about that. This, this tells you the difference between where you are at your age and where I am at my age. I think about stuff like this when we're not in class or when I'm walking to and from class in my office. And I should have done something with that um, last week, and I failed to do it. So that, there's that one. Now, I've actually seen this. I don't know if I'd go this far, that this particular equation is one of the most beautiful in mathematics because of all the numbers that are in it. I see those faces, too. Like. Not beautiful, but it is pretty neat to have all those strange numbers in that equation. All right, let's look at some examples of these cases. <coughs> Just brought a sheet of problems. We'll put one up here. I don't even know necessarily when we start what case that is. Chandler, can we prop that door open? I don't know if it's just me, but it seems a little hot in here. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Yes. OK. Thank you. OK, let's say we had this second order differential equation, and we're trying to get ourselves reviewed a little bit. So I said we'd review just about everything today. Second order, why is this second order? Second derivatives, okay. Uh, linear, why is it linear? You don't really see anything squared. We don't have a second derivative squared, a first derivative squared, the original function squared, so it's all linear. Uh, homogeneous, where'd that word come from? It's all y. It's all in terms of y's and y primes and y double primes, but where's, we're going to have, starting tomorrow, we're going to have non-homogeneous equations. Equal it's equal to zero. So the fact that it's equal to zero means it's a homogeneous. Now, we're going to use that. We're not going to drop that, and it's going to fall off the map starting tomorrow. We're still going to use the homogeneous part of a solution, but if it's something that's not equal to zero, we're going to have to kind of think about how it is that we get those things that aren't equal to zero. Right now, we don't have to worry about them. We want to make them zero. So we go to the characteristic equation. I don't know. We probably ought to review this part, too. What are these y things that have a chance of working in a second order linear homogeneous differential equation? E to the RT. E to the RT. Or e to the r. We don't know what the other Something. variable is. Let's, let's call it x here. Why do they have a chance of working? Because they are their own derivatives with some different coefficients in front, as well as their own second derivatives, again, with different coefficients out in front. What is y prime? R e to r. <laughs> and y double prime. And if we put them in the equation, which you don't have to do this, but we're trying to kind of get reviewed on these things, 
doesn't have to be every problem where you do this. Now, the fact that it is homogeneous, we're actually going to be able to get a solution. We can factor out uh, e to the rx. Remember this stuff from before the break, I hope? There's something on the test that I need to address, too, before we do a second review problem. Um, since we have the product of two things equals zero, that equals zero. Well, we're not going to get any solutions out of that. E to something is never zero. So there's our characteristic equation. It has a whole lot of similar features to what we started with. So we'll go about solving that, <clears throat> and then we'll jump to the solution. So what are the R values that we could actually plug into that position for this particular example? R minus 6, R plus 1. 3 and 2. All right, well, I heard 1 and 6 and 3 and 2, so let's see which. It's minus 3 and minus 2. Minus 3, yeah. minus 2 yeah. is going to work? So that gives us the minus 5 in the middle, and their product is the 6. Now, if you use 6 and 1, you'd have to have 1 positive and 1 negative, right, which won't get us plus 6. So it could, we could get negative 5 in the middle, but we can't get plus 6 unless they both have the same sign. So R1, if we want to call it that, is 3. R2 is 2. So what's the nature of the solution here? What are the y things? And it should be a family of curves unless we know some additional information, which we don't on this problem. Interesting looks this morning. So I got a, uh, while we're contemplating and pondering on this problem. I got an interesting email from a student that I taught in 1979, and he was going across the cable TV numbers and happened to stumble on channel 18, which this broadcast is on. And, and he goes, I found myself looking away from the TV screen so you wouldn't call on me, just like I did in 1979, which is kind of funny that he was, he was quite a character. Anyway. Um, I got a kick out of that. If you knew this kid, too, he's probably in his 40s now, but um, pretty funny. All right, that's plenty of time. A little <laughs> off to the side there. Plenty of time for you to think about this. What? C1, I like that. C to the 3x. Good. Plus C2x. Uh, <coughs> no, nope, that'd be a double root. E to the 2. Yeah. So this, this is case 1, right? Two distinct real roots. So it's, in general, when you have two distinct real roots, that's what the solution is going to look like. So you put one of those real roots up here, the other real root here. If you don't have any additional information that's going to help us find C1 or C2, then we, we're done. That's it for that type. Questions about any piece of that before we go forward? Look familiar, I hope? Okay, let's see what happens. This one doesn't look very kind. So I'm thinking with that 13 there that this is not going to factor when we get to the characteristic equation, uh, but let's see what happens. Okay, what's the characteristic equation? R squared minus 4 plus 13 equals 0. Thank you. Don't want to waste a whole lot of time trying to factor this one, right? Factors of 13. Not a lot there to work with, 
certainly not going to give us negative 4 in the middle. So quadratic equation solves for the variable that's being squared, which in this case is r. Tell me what to write down. 4 plus or minus the square root 16 minus 4 times 1 times 13. 4ac, yeah. right? b squared minus 4ac under the radical. In fact, that's how the authors of this supplement that you have, that's how they categorize the solutions based on the, what's happening with the b squared minus 4ac term. So if it's negative, which I think is going to be the case here, then we're into case 3 all over twice a. All right, what do we get under the radical? Negative 36. Negative 36. Negative means we're dealing with imaginary solutions or complex solutions. So 4 plus or minus square root of negative 36. 6i. Six and everything in the numerator can be reduced by 2 as well as the denominator. So the end result is... So let's jump from here to the solution. Now, we don't want to go to that one with uh, this ugly stuff in the exponent position. We've already fought that battle. We've got another type of solution uh, when we have two complex solutions that are conjugates of one another. What's that look like? C1 times B2A plus C2B uh, we could, but we had a, uh, another version of that after two or three pages of squaring and cubing and grouping together like terms and putting in K1s and K2s. E to the... Alpha. Well, we're going to get an alpha and a beta out of this solution, okay. solutions to the characteristic equation. Alpha is 2, beta is 3. So what's the solution in terms of alpha and beta? e to the 2x. Okay. e to the 2x, so e to the alpha x. In parentheses, c1 cosine of, or k1 cosine Doesn't of. matter. c1 or k1, doesn't matter. Um, 3x plus C, uh, K2 sine of 3x. Does that look familiar? So it's e to the alpha x times C1 cosine beta x plus C2 sine beta x. Yes. So you can use C's or K's. I think we ended up with K's because we had, to, we had some C1s and C2s and I's and we got rid of them and put in K's. So that was our case three, right? Two complex roots. So you can go right to the characteristic equation, get the solutions, identify alpha and beta, and go right to the solution. If we don't have any additional information, then we just leave it here. So I know it's supposed to be exponential type functions. That's what we started with when we were kind of building the characteristic equation. And then we found y prime, and we found y double prime, and so on. But we now have a way of converting something that's in this form into something that isn't just exponential in nature, but is trigonometric in nature. So that's why we end up with cosines and sines, because of the equation that we had earlier in the class and before we went on break. So that's case three two complex roots to the characteristic equation. So we're missing case two. What was that? A double root. So real roots, but they are the same. R1 and R2 are the same. Let's see if I can find one of those real quickly.
characteristic equation? Four squared minus four r plus four equals zero. Factored. R minus two and R minus two. So R one and R two are the same. So this is case two, double root to the characteristic equation. What did that what did that solution type look like? C one E to the two X plus C two X E to the two. Look right? So that was case two, double root, both roots are real. So this is kind of the answer we would normally come up with if we had a C2 and we didn't put the X there. This term and this term would be the same, so they're redundant. You really don't need both of them. This actually has a chance of working as, and in fact does work because of the terms that are produced when you're finding y prime and y double prime because of the product rule. So because of how the product rule works, um, we can generate some more e to the 2x terms as well as x e to the 2x terms. They all have a chance of knocking each other out and you can end up with all this stuff on the left side dropping out and just having zero on the right side. All right, so there's the three cases. Um, one of the things I noticed on the test, let me see what problem that was. This is one of the parts, and this was problem four. Yes, problem four had two parts. One where you approximated the solution using Euler's method, and the other where you found the exact solution. So this was a separable differential equation. So I saw this error, and if you see a big blue arrow and a capital no, underlined with some exclamation marks after it. Um, you're one of the guilty parties here, and that's why I'm addressing this particular situation. If each problem is worth 16 points, actually this is part of problem, so 4A was worth 8 points, and 4B was worth 8 points. So 4B being worth 8 points, if I had my druthers, I would take off 30 points on the eight point problem for this mistake, okay? But I didn't do that, that would be unfair. But this is a, a, a mistake we need to, from this point forward, we need to avoid. So we wanna separate, this wasn't the problem. Uh, we need to multiply by 1 over y squared. Okay. This is fine, everybody that got to this point successfully. Now here's where the error came, where we integrated both sides. What you see on the left side never has been a natural log is not today a natural log and will never be a natural log. For something to be a natural log, we have to have that to the what power in the denominator? Negative. To the first power, okay? This is to the second power. Has never been a natural log, is not today a natural log, and will never be a natural log. So you, you can't develop this mindset of any time you see one over something, like one over secant, that's natural log secant. Or one over Steve, well that's natural log of Steve. Okay? It doesn't work that way. The only time we have a natural log is when we have one over y 
and we also have dy. 1 over u, and we also have du. 1 over t, and we also have dt. So when you see that y squared there, that takes it out of that situation. In fact, 1 over y squared is really y to the negative second. So some of you said to the negative first, so that you were thinking correctly. If you saw negative first, and you also had derivative of that, then that's a natural log, but this isn't. What is the integral of y to the negative second dy? Negative. Y to the, it's a power rule, right? Negative. Don't we add 1 to the exponent? Divide by the new exponent. So if we add 1 to the exponent and divide by that new exponent, that's what we get, which drastically changes the nature of the solution from this point. If you had a natural log, you're going to exponentiate both sides. If you didn't have a natural log, which this is not, then you're not going to exponentiate both sides. So it, the solution is just completely different from this point. I think it's probably worth a couple of minutes to finish this one because of what some of you did. You did some flipping, which is fine as long as you completely take the equation, left side flip it, right side flip it. There could be a constant which will fuse into the right side. Uh, what's the integral of negative x dx? Negative x squared over t. And I'll put that constant there. That was a mistake that some people made. So there's our equation. We separated, we integrated properly on the left side, I hope. So y to the negative first over negative 1 is the same thing as some of you, which I would join in on that particular bandwagon, I would, seeing a negative here and a negative here, and a constant doesn't really matter if it's positive or negative, you could multiply through the whole equation by negative 1. You don't have to. But if you do that, that's positive. This is now positive. And this is now negative, so you can just change it to another letter. It's an unknown constant. It's the negative of what we started with. You can still call it C if you want to. This is where, if you want to solve for Y, which you don't really have to, to plug in the values and get a solution, but nor normally we like to solve things for Y. Um, so that's easily done on the left side by just flipping it. Now the right side, you can't just flip the two pieces. You got to flip the whole thing. So the right side is really this over 1, right? So we've got 1 over y. We've got a single fraction here. We've got this ugly numerator over 1. Now if you flip both sides, You've got that. y over 1 is just y. And I think we know a point, right, that this goes through. Don't we have a starting point in problem 4? Yes, when x is 0, y is 1. So that'll help you find B. I think B in this problem is one. So if you plug in zero for X and one for Y, it turns out that B is one. So you have this equation. And we want to know what is the y value. And in part A, we did the Euler's method, and we incrementally went by, what, a half each time? No, a quarter? What was it? Went from 0 to 2, right? And we, our increment was a half each time, our delta x. So when x is 2, what is the y value? So 
So there's a 2 plus 1, which is a third, which ought to fit in with part A in the problem if you did that properly, which most of you did. Um, you got 0 0.30 for the approximation, which seems reasonable here that the exact value is a third. We approximated it using the tangent line to the curve, and we got 0 0.30. So seems like it's reasonable. So when you flip one side, you have to flip the entire other side. You can't just flip each piece. Okay. All right, let's get one of these, and then we'll kind of see what it is that we're going to encounter in the next section, and we'll kind of dive into the nuts and bolts of that tomorrow. That's a different look, but isn't that the same kind of equation, right? Second derivative, first derivative, original y thing. So we can go directly to the characteristic equation, which is? First squared minus 2 Factor? Probably not. So, what? 4 plus or minus 4 minus 4 times 1 times 5. Isn't it 2? Two, two, two. Two. Oh, 2, negative B. Thank you. Just testing you, see if you're awake here after the vacation. I guess I'm not awake. So b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Under the radical, we've got a 4 minus 20, negative 16. 2 plus or minus 4i all over 2. So the final solution of the characteristic equation plus or minus 2i. So alpha is 1, beta is 2. We have y's and x's, so we do want y in terms of x. Tell me what the solution is, and then we'll continue with additional information. C1, or e to the 2 x. Okay, e to the 1 x. C1 cosine 2x plus C2 sine 2x. Okay. Got agreement on that? So we've got this information. Let's put it to use, which will probably allow us to solve for C1 and C2. Uh, when x is 0, y is 0. Let's see what happens. So does anything disappear here? Sine of 2, 0 would be sine of 0, which is 0. So that eliminates C2. Cosine of 2, 0 is cosine of 0, which is 1. So we have C1 times 1, C2 times 0. 
And what's e to the 0? Is 1. So C2 times 0, that's gone. Oh, this is kind of good. This hasn't happened on a problem yet, but obviously it happens from time to time because it happened in this one. So we end up with C1 equals 0. So what's that say? That, go ahead. That the cosine, that whole piece cancels out. That's right. There isn't one. We allowed for the possibility of C1 cosine 2x, but apparently in this particular problem, C1 is 0, and that term doesn't appear in the final answer. So C1 is 0, so at this point, our solution Normally, we would have a C1 cosine 2x here. C1 is 0. So we just have what? C2 sine 2x. Is that right? This, we might have the time today to do something. This isn't that different from the original solution. I mean, it looks like there's a term that's gone. It's going to be drastically different. It's not very different from the solution that we had earlier. All right, so we found C1. It's 0. That term's gone. Now we need to find C2. We've got additional information, and that is up here. When x is 0, the derivative is 1. So now we need to take this equation right here and take the derivative. That's a little bit easier now that C1 was 0, so it's gone from the equation. What's the derivative? First times derivative of second. Derivative of sine of 2x is? 2 times 3. 3. Two cosine 2x. Is that right? Derivative of sine of u is cosine of u du. So there's the du. So there's first times derivative of second plus second. times derivative of first, derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So there's a product rule made a little bit simpler because c1 was 0. So what is supposed to be the case when x is 0, dy over dx is 1. So for y prime, we're going to put in 1. Everywhere we see an x, we're going to put in 0. What about that second term? It's the Gone, right? Because sine of 0 is 0, and it's multiplied by two other things, which really doesn't matter. So that's all 0. e to the 0 is 1. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we've got 1 times c2 times 2 times 1, which is what? 2 c2. C2 is 1 half. So our final answer, e to the 1x, <laughs> e to the x, C2, which is 1 half, sine of 2x. Let me, let's analyze this just slightly, and then I want to adapt what could potentially be a solution and then see what you think the graph would look like. So if, I, if we were to ignore this e to the x, what would this thing look like? Y 
one half sine of two x. What's the amplitude? Right. How far up and down it goes from its axis? Be a half, right? Amplitude is a half. And the period is it's affected inversely by the two, so it's half of what it normally is. So normally the period of a sine is 2 pi. Now the period is pi. So we've got this oscillatory function. If I ignore the e to the x, we've got this function that it's a sine. So it goes up to a half, down to negative a half, up to a half, down to negative a half. And it goes through that full cycle every pi radians because of the coefficient 2. Now what would that do to it? Can't we kind of loop that together in a way with this one half and say that's now the amplitude? Right? E to the x each time is going to be a number. As x gets larger, e to the x gets larger. So this would have a varying increasing amplitude, right? As x gets larger, e to the x gets larger. So if we had an increasing amplitude, this is kind of unrealistic. That's why I want to change the example. So our first amplitude is a half, and then the next time maybe we're down here, and the next time we're up here. I think if you were designing a bridge, this, I mean, this would be a problem if you were a bridge designer. And the amplitude, as the force kind of increases on the bridge, the bridge begins to kind of move a little bit. And then as time goes by, it begins to move even further. Not a good bridge, right? That bridge, in fact, will not be a bridge it's pretty soon down the road here. So you want what to happen with vibrations like this? You would want a lead coefficient, instead of being e to the x, you would want it to be e to the negative x, right? If you had a lead coefficient, what would that do to the oscillations or the vibrations? Wouldn't they get smaller as x gets larger? Doesn't this get smaller as x gets larger? So if your first one is up here, your next one is here. The period stays the same, by the way. This is why when the battery in your watch goes down, it doesn't do a bad job keeping time. It still keeps time. It just kind of gets to the point where it doesn't move things anymore. So the period stays the same. That's what we would like to happen, right? With vibrations, for them eventually to diminish where they dissipate and they're gone. We don't want this to happen. This is trouble. This is expected. So if we had something out in front that caused the amplitude to diminish, that would be a good thing. Here's the amplitude. There it is. There it is. And so on. So it's getting less as we go. Um, let's finish up today with this, and we can just start completely new in 7.8 tomorrow with the non-homogeneous. Let's say we had an equation. Let me try to keep this pretty simple. So we've got some sines added to some cosines. And of course, now we've got some coefficients out in front. But let's say that coefficient is 0, or is 1. If it's 0, then we can just go home now because it's not very interesting. But if it's 1, now sine plus cosine. I don't know if you've ever used this technique, but sometimes it comes in handy. Let's split this up into two pieces. One piece is the sine. The other piece is the cosine, because we know each of those pretty quickly. And then we'll just add them up on the graph. So let's take it through one cycle, and hopefully we'll see enough of it to at least say that it's believable. So let's do the sine of x. Sine of 0 is 0. Pi over 2 is 1. Pi, we're back here to 0. 3 pi over 2. All 
All right, let's do cosine. Cosine of zero is one. Then it's at pi over two, it's down to zero. At pi, it's negative one. Then back to zero, and then here. Now, we've got the sum of these two. Can't we just add them up graphically at individual values? The answer to that is yes, we can. So at x equals 0, let's add them up. Where are the two individual pieces? 1 and 0, their sum is 1. 0 plus 1 added together is 1. Let's actually do this point right here at pi over 4. The sine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2. The cosine of pi over 4, that was kind of funny. I thought that was humorous too. <laughs> the cosine of pi over 4 is even funnier. It's also square root of 2 over 2. What do you get when you add half the square root of 2 to half the square root of 2? You get the square root of 2. So it's this distance added to itself, which would be roughly up there. All right, let's move on to pi over 2. We're adding 0 to 1, which is 1. Oh, my graph's decent here. I don't know. Here we're adding positive square root of 2 to negative square root of 2. What's their sum? Square root of 2 over 2 would be 0, right? One's positive, one's negative. So if you add them together, you get 0. 0 plus negative 1 is negative 1. Here's negative square root of 2 over 2 added to itself, which is negative square root of 2. Here's 0 added to 1. Positive square root of 2 over 2, negative square root of 2 over 2. We'll add those together, and 0 added to 1. So the black marks with the x on them should be sine plus cosine. I just added them up graphically. So we added two functions that individually are oscillatory functions. Is their sum also an oscillatory function? Is it oscillating yes. with the same kind of peaks and coming the same period each time we go forward to the, to the right? It is also oscillatory. So it's not that different from a sine or a cosine. In fact, we don't have time for this today, but we'll get an equation tomorrow of what sine plus cosine actually looks like. What's the period, by the way? Does it start to repeat itself in exactly the same space that the sine and cosine repeated themselves. Sure, it, it kind of almost has to, right? Aren't we repeating the same values here that we were here? So we're going to start the same cycle all over again? So our final graph is oscillatory also, just like the two components of it. So if you eliminate one of the components, it doesn't make it that much different than if you had both of them present. So we'll do slight, slightly a little bit more with this, but um, that'll at least make it believable that we can eliminate C1 or C2 and get the same answer. See you tomorrow.